now proceeding to give the negative five first five minute rebuttal. I don't care if it's like a chicken or a turkey, I don't want to look at me. They're <laughs> <laughs> really giving me a look. <laughs> So, so thanks everyone again. So here's the problem with what Bruce told us. Grant and I had real substance to our philosophy and our economical arguments and our responses to hit our, his arguments, but Bruce just didn't directly respond to anything we told you. And the problem with this is that he gets rid of the premise of his arguments. He just asserts that we don't care about the hunger problem. No, that's not what Grant and I tell you. In fact, we care about the hunger problem very deeply. It's consistent with our philosophical system where we say we care about people's rights. What we tell you is that uh, saying that vegetarianism is the solution to the hunger, hunger problem is deceptive, because it's not. It's simply not the way the world works. Economically, this food doesn't somehow magically make its way to the rest of the world. It just doesn't get produced. So, so it's not like there's this pot of food that's going to exist, exist no matter what. It's that there will be less farmers if we don't have animals. And even if his, if, even if his like, ultimate solution comes about, where like, look, we have all this food, it keeps being produced, and all of it's sent to Africa, that's called dumping, as Grant tells you. And that disrupts local farms, which means the individual countries never have the ability to create their own sustainable food supply. So when one day our huge, massive, illogical pot of food stops existing, then they don't have anything to eat. So I, th I think Bruce really needs to deal with the substance of our arguments. But he's like, uh, look, uh, I don't need an ethical system to decide these things are wrong. So what Grant and I can tell you is that you probably do need an ethical system. Even, <laughs> even the things he tells you aren't clear cases. Is it unethical when I don't recycle? That's hurting the environment. I think the standard has to be something a little bit higher than like maybe there's some harms to an action because there's some benefits to actions too. Grant gives us this idea that we could cut down a forest to get medicine to actually be able to cure people's diseases. There we have two of his ethical imperatives in tension. This idea of like ending suffering and also this idea of protecting the environment. Unless he can tell us how we can adjudicate these tough cases, then I don't know how to adjudicate this particular tough case. How I can decide if I'm a bad person, if I'm acting unethically by eating meat. So that's why we need an ethical system. So he's like, look, animals feel pain. So I don't think this is enough to give these people rights. There's a group of human beings who have like a rare genetic disorder. That means they like literally don't feel pain. Does that mean they don't get rights? I don't think that's the case. I think rights come from something much more we say rights come from rationality, and so far as animals are rational, they shouldn't have rights. Then Bruce gives us this tough example. He's like, well, what isn't setting a, a cat's tail on fire really terrible? So one, I'm not sure a cat's tail will burn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not willing to do that experiment. But even so, suppose really bizarrely we could set a cat's tail on fire, and it led to a medical advancement that saved a hundred lives. In that case, I would probably do it, because I think it's really important. And preface people who like want to make plans for their life, who want to do good, very good things with their life, who want to achieve their dreams. And when they die, I think that's a much more substantial rights violation than eating the displeasure, although I'm sure it's severe, of a cat having its tail on the So furthermore, Grant gives you a couple other things that I think are really important. What he tells you is that it's not the case that these animals can just like live great lives if they all become vegetarians. So firstly, if we release them, they'll like, like, they're all adopted to be living in captivity. They'll just all be instantly eaten by foxes and shit. It's, <laughs> it's not the case that some, like, the alternative is animals living these, this great life. The alternative is a probably more painful death at the hands of something that's less good. Um, secondly, so without the meat industry, these animals just simply wouldn't exist. Like there would be, there would probably be no species of cow, at least as we know it now, without a meat industry. So then we have to ask a really deep philosophical question. Is there a reason to preference existence over non-existence, even if the existence is like not that great? I think there is a reason to preference existence. I think if I had the choice of living a kind of bad life or not existing at all, I would probably choose to exist. Because I think there's something very special to having life. There's something very special to existence. And the simple fact is that without the meat industry, these animals like, wouldn't exist at all. So there's a tough philosophical question that I think he needs to deal with. So I think we advance a, a moral system in which we tell you animals are the ones that have rights. And our moral system allows you to clearly adjudicate this question. 
which tells you, yes, eating animals is ethical because it makes human beings ha happier. On the other side is a group that, that we, we are not ascribing rights to, that we don't think there's, we don't think you can call something unethical because it doesn't treat them well. I think if Bruce really wants to get back in this debate, he needs to espouse his own ethical system that's much more robust, more robust than this. I guess he has another speech to do it. Good luck. Thank <laughs> you.